Move my chat out of the way. And uh, so let me get my video on. And I uh, certainly want to welcome everybody uh, to the uh, to the session. Sorry, we had a few uh, technical difficulties here. Uh, new platform, so we'll we'll get these uh, sorted out. Um, uh, want to welcome any new participants to the happy hour, uh, and certainly want to welcome back uh, any of our um, attendees who are back for another time. And um, Dr. Martin is actually going to be running the session next week, and we we're going to try and introduce him. Uh, today, but we'll, we'll get that taken care of next week. Um, if you have any questions at all at the end of today's session, please feel free to uh, click on the link, the education link in your email, or you can uh, email me directly at tdavis at sagesdx.com. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with our first slide. This is an excisional biopsy specimen, uh, and this is from the trunk. And um, if you look in the left half, or the right half rather, of the biopsy specimen, we'll go ahead and circle it here, you can see that the dermis is a little thicker. And moving to higher power, one can see uh, that it's a little bit more hypercellular. Uh, more cells in the dermis, it has kind of that busy, dizzy dermis look. Um, and when you see that type of pattern on scan, you know, you need to be thinking about things like uh, dermatofibroma, uh, blue nevus, granuloma annulari, uh, sclerotic edema, KS, things that produce kind of a hypercellular dermis. Uh, you can also note at uh, scanning magnification that there are lymphoid aggregates present uh, within the dermis. And if we move to uh, to higher power and see what the nature of the cellular infiltrate is. A little pixelation here, we'll give it a minute to, to kind of catch up. Uh, one can see uh, solitary cells as well as small little nested aggregates and cords and strands of cells that are uh, extending between the collagen bubbles. Some are noted to kind of line up back to back. These cells have round to oval nuclei. Some are a little bit hyperchromatic and some are pleomorphic. And most of the cells have fairly abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. This particular patient had a history of breast cancer, and this is an example of a metastatic breast carcinoma. Uh, does produce, uh, in one of its patterns, a uh, kind of busy dermis with uh, cells that tend to line up and extend between collagen bundles. These cells, of course, would be positive for cytokeratin, uh, as well as EMA, cytokeratin 7, and possibly ER or PR, depending upon the uh, hormonal status of the original tumor. So this is an example of metastatic breast carcinoma. Definitely want to keep it in the uh, differential of a hypersensitive dermis. Uh, moving on to slide two. Slide two is uh, a punch biopsy. This is from the trunk. Uh, we have a bubble here uh, on the slide. Sorry about that. Uh, and again, within the dermis, uh, one can see an increased number of cells. So we've kind of got that same differential, kind of a hypercellular dermis. If you look at the uh, right half of the, the uh, field in this specimen, you can see uh, some zones that are a little less cellular than others. Of note here, the epidermis is papillated and hyperplastic. And there are uh, enlarged sebaceous glands right near the surface of the specimen. Almost looks like sebaceous hyperplasia. If we move to higher power, uh, we can see that within the dermis, there are these short fascicles of fairly uniform spindled cells. Uh, they kind of produce a storiform or mat-like pattern. Uh, little nuclear pleomorphism, but certainly no mitotic figures. And at the periphery of the lesion, there's clearly uh, evidence here of collagen trapping. Uh, there is some uh, 
There are a few larger nodular aggregates of the periphery of the lesion, and uh, you know maybe a slight increase in the amount of melanin pigment within the base layer. This is a, of course, a dermatofibroma, and um, dermatofibromas frequently do induce uh, epidermal hyperplasia or follicular induction, and sometimes the uh, presence of large sebaceous glands just beneath a hyperplastic epidermis can be a clue to the uh, diagnosis of an underlying uh, dermatofibroma. Um, sometimes I've, I've found that uh, uh, residents who are first starting out will confuse dermatofibromas with neurofibromas. They're both composed of spindle cells, but dermatofibromas are kind of bullies and they tend to displace the adnexy, uh, pushing them uh, either up or over to the, to the uh, sides of the specimen as you can see here, whereas neurofibromas tend to course around the adnexy and are a little bit more delicate. We'll go ahead and move on to slide three. This is a uh, punch biopsy uh, from distal extremity. Note the absence of solar elastosis, which should uh, make you think of uh, specifically lower extremity. And uh, there are a few thick walled vessels here in the papillary dermis confirming that this is indeed from the uh, lower extremity. And what we have here, of course, is a, a paniculitis. Uh, the action is involving that compartment of the skin, the subcutaneous tissue. And as I'm sure most of you are aware, when we approach paniculitis, uh, we need to determine first and foremost where the center of gravity is. That is, are we dealing predominantly with a septal paniculitis or a lobular paniculitis? Realizing, of course, there is some some overlap. I mean, a septal paniculitis is always going to, to have some spillover into the bat lobules, as we can see here. And right away, I mean, it, it's pretty obvious that the, the fiber septi are uh, thickened and somewhat fibrotic. There is a little spillover into the bat lobules, but most of the changes here are centered on the fiber septi. If we move to higher power, we can see, uh, again, broad zones of fibrosis. Uh, within the subcutaneous tissue. There are, uh, out at the uh, periphery of the affected lobules, a few multinucleated epithelioid histiocytes. And um, even closer to the fat lobule, one can see an infiltrate of lymphocytes and even a few scattered eosinophils and neutrophils. And this layered or sandwich-like pattern with central zone of fibrosis granulomatous inflammation out of the uh, periphery of the lesion and um, acute inflammatory cells uh, present uh, close to the lobule is uh, diagnostic of, um, of uh, erythema nodosum. Excuse me here, I'm gonna go ahead and close out my email account or my um, emails here. It has a tendency to kind of slow down the path presenter. Okay, so this is an example of erythema nodosum. It's a granulomatous septal paniculitis and is kind of our prototype for a uh, septal paniculitis. Slide four is a uh, punch biopsy. Uh, this is actually from um, the proximal extremity. Um, and what uh, one notices at first blush is there's not much of an inflammatory infiltrate within the if we uh, kind of hone in on the uh, epidermis, especially I think in this bottom piece, uh, we can see that the cornified layer is a little thickened by compact orthokeratosis. And notice the epidermis, the dermal papillae here are widened. And uh, that can be a useful clue to this condition. And if we look in the widened papillae, we can see a deposition of kind of a pinkish blue fissured material uh, associated with a few scattered melanophages. And uh, this material, of course, is amyloid, keratin derived amyloid. And this is uh, an early lesion of lichen amyloidosis. And uh, we have widening of the dermal papillae. I'm going to go ahead and rotate this. And overlying lichen simplex. So this is an example of uh, macular amyloidosis. 
Uh, moving on to slide five, uh, and uh, I will go ahead and uh, give me a second. I'll go ahead and flip the, um, the slide. And uh, what we can see in this particular fragmented biopsy specimen uh, is uh, an intraepidermal vesicle. And we've talked about intraepidermal vesicles uh, in several of the previous happy hours. And again, one of the key things with an intraepidermal vesicle is to figure out what mechanism caused the vesicle. Here, uh, continuing with our theme of the last few weeks, there is a focus of superbasilar acanthalysis. Now note here, unlike the example of Haley Haley that we saw, you look at the particular area that I'm circling, the overlying epidermis is intact and there's not much dyskeratosis. And then uh, another key feature uh, to note in these sections is there's pronounced extension of the acanthalysis into uh, infundibular epithelium and indeed, the acanthalysis, uh, you can see even extending into this eparine ductal element over at the side. The uh, it accompanying inflammatory infiltrate was sparse, composed of lymphocytes and a few eosinophils. And these uh, changes are, are uh, most suggestive of pemphigus vulgaris. And of course, you want to confirm that with uh, appropriate ELISA or immunofluorescence testing. Uh, moving on, slide six punch biopsy here. First blush looks uh, like it's from uh, uh, close to April skin, a very compact cornified layer. The slide itself is a little pale, probably has been projected a number of times. Uh, the surface of the specimen is papillated. There's uh, hypergranulosis and the papillary dermis is kind of thickened by coarse collagen in vertical streaks. Uh, all associated with not much of an inflammatory infiltrate. There's only a very sparse superficial perivascular infiltrate here. And uh, these findings are diagnostic of, of lichen simplex chronicus. Uh, unlike the case of psoriasis that we saw, uh, here you can see that the epidermal hyperplasia is a little bit more irregular. And of course, the granular layer is intact. Now, if you have a biopsy with a cornified layer that looks like this, and there's a big hair follicle in the center of it, I mean, that's, that's again, the, uh, the, the so-called hairy palm sign, because you shouldn't have a biopsy uh, uh, that, with a cornified layer that looks like uh, a volar surface in uh, a specimen in which there is a hair follicle. So this is an example of lichen simplex chronicus. When I do see a biopsy uh, that I'm suspecting is lichen simplex chronicus, I'll usually try to scrutinize the uh, sections pretty carefully to see if I can see what the trigger was uh, for LSC. But in, in most cases like this, you know, the inciting dermatitis is gone and, and you, you really can't, um, or you, you, you can't render much of a clue as to, to what's causing the patient's puritis. Uh, moving on to, to uh, slide seven here, really beautiful example. Uh, this is a uh, punch biopsy. It's from the head and neck. Note the very high concentration of follicular and sebaceous elements. And if you look at the epidermis, you can see there's a little bit of uh, basket weave hyperkeratosis. The specimen is um, slightly papillated. The reedy are elongated and uh, uh, there is an increased amount of melanin pigment within uh, the uh, basal layer. A few little horn cysts here. Looks a lot like a, a early macular seborrheic keratosis or reticulated seborrheic keratosis. But of course, you notice that there's extension of this change into infundibular uh, epithelium. Most striking, uh, of course, in uh, obviously pencil to work in the left half of the specimen. And this, this finding is virtually diagnostic of uh, dowling dagos disease or uh, reticulated pigment and anomaly of flexors. Of course, tends to occur in, in the uh, second or third decade of life and frequently involves the uh, sides of the neck, the ocella, sometimes the groin. And um, if there was this change with superbase or acanthalysis, one would need to think about, of course, the, the uh, diagnosis of gali disease. But uh, 
this is this is uh, there's nothing else that really gives you this histologic picture. Slide eight is a punch biopsy from Bolar skin, markedly thickened um, stratum corneum, uh, absence really of uh, uh, an exo structure short of these uh, eggrine elements here, but certainly no follicular units. There's really not much of an inflammatory infiltrate. And the findings are somewhat subtle, but if you if you hone in on the stratum corneum, you can see kind of a bluish color and a little pit in the stratum corneum, evident at one particular edge of the biopsy specimen. And if you uh, honed in on that area, see if I get this to drag down a little bit, you could see these colonies of uh, coxobacilli, these very delicate filamentous organisms. And of course, these are, are carinibacterium and diphtheroides species. And this is an example of uh, pitted keratolysis. Uh, you get organisms, of course, of similar morphology in uh, uh, lesions of erythrasm. Uh, but uh, you know, if you don't uh, uh, if you don't see much on the initial sections, uh, it's always good to go through the litany of beginning in the stratum corneum and working down looking for organisms subtle changes uh, that might lead you to the correct diagnosis. Just a really pretty example of uh, pitted keratolysis. We don't see a biopsy very often. I mean, the, the clinical presentation and the smell uh, are so distinctive that uh, usually doesn't get biopsied, at least not by dermatologists. Slide nine, uh, we're uh, in a different box here. We've got a uh, fairly circumscribed nodule here. Looks like it's shelled out, so, you know, uh, hard to say where it was from. Uh, most tumors that shell out like this are fairly deep, so I suspect this was probably deep dermis subcutaneous tissue. Um, as we move to higher power, we can see the stroma is kind of pink and a little bit chondroid or mixoid, and, um, one can see very elongated uh, branching tubules and ducts containing this inspissated material. Um, most of the uh, ducts are lined by kind of flattened cuboidal epithelium. Uh, there are a few little horn cysts here. And uh, again, this stroma, uh, that's uh, very chondroid and mixoid in areas. And this, of course, is a, uh, a mixed tumor of skin or chondroid syringoma. Um, there are, are kind of two histologic variants of a mixed tumor of skin. There's one with elongated branching tubules that most people believe is, is African uh, in nature. And then there's one with small duct alumina that, that may be more eccrine or ductal in nature as opposed to, to tubular uh, in nature. The one thing to keep in mind with, uh, with these mixed tumors is that they uh, are histologically indistinguishable from pleomorphic adenomas that occur in the salivary gland. So if you get the diagnosis of a mixed tumor back from a, from a path lab and you, you biopsy uh, the uh, area uh, preauricular in front of the parotid, you know, you may want to uh, to have the patient seen by ENT or do imaging studies just to make sure that you haven't sampled a pleomorphic adenoma of the parotid gland rather than a uh, mixed tumor of skin. Slide 10. So again, a little bit of a pale slide. This is a punch biopsy from the trunk. And uh, one can see a sparse, superficial uh, perivascular infiltrate, a little extension of the infiltrate around vessels in the mid-reticular dermis. As we move to higher power, it becomes pretty obvious that the dermal epidermal junction is not real crisp. Uh, we've got a basket we've quantified there, but the epidermis is kind of thinned with uh, effacement of the reedy ridge pattern. And uh, there clearly is uh, back EOR change in that along the dermal epidermal junction. The underlying dermis contains an infiltrate of lymphocytes, 
or scattered melanophages. There were extravasated erythrocytes uh, in these sections, and there were some eosinophils uh, present in areas. Uh, and if you look at the dermis, you know, there's silver elastosis to be sure, but there's also a subtle increase in the amount of dermal mucin. And again, this infiltrate of lymphocytes around vessels of the superficial vascular plexus. And, and when you see this type of change, you know, interface macular type, lymphocytes and eosinophils, you know, you, you, you want to think about the drug eruption. Uh, you can also think about the possibility of a connective tissue disease, although the presence of eosinophils would be somewhat unusual. Uh, in a connective tissue disease. As it turns out, this biopsy was from a patient with drug-induced subacute cutaneous uh, lupus. The patient had photosensitivity in an annular polycyclic eruption, had real SSA positivity, and uh, the trigger in this particular patient was uh, terbinafine, which has been reported to uh, trigger SCLA in certain patients. And again, PPIs have also been reported uh, the, the list of medications that can trigger SCLA continues to, uh, to grow. Um, histologically, and I think we've made this point before, dermatomyositis and SCLA can be virtually impossible uh, to distinguish one from another. Uh, so the, the, the distinction between the two is often made uh, clinically and serologically, and I you know, wouldn't worry about discriminating those two particular questions or conditions on an exam. If somebody asked it to, that, that would be a very poor question. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to slide 11, kind of a cool case. Um, here we've got a, a shade biopsy. Uh, there's scale crust in the stratum corneum. Uh, the epidermis is somewhat hyperplastic. And you know, we've got this nodular infiltrate in the dermis. And I think even at scanning magnification, you can see there are lymphocytes to be sure, but there are large epithelioid cells here, some multinucleated. So you know, getting the, the idea that this may be granulomatous. And uh, the epidermis is somewhat hyperplastic. And anytime I see granulomatous inflammation with a hyperplastic epidermis, you know, we have to think about uh, infectious processes. And if we go in and uh, look in the foci of granulomatous inflammation, and specifically in the um, cytoplasm of uh, some of these histiocytes, we begin to see these kind of uh, clear to slightly blue-gray morula-like structures that, that really do resemble uh, soccer balls. I think they're even better seen up here. And this, this histologic appearance, of course, is, is very characteristic for prototheicosis. Uh, prototheicosis is an achloric algae. It can be found in, found in tree slime. Uh, and there really is nothing that gives you uh, uh, an appearance like this, uh, short of prototheicosis. Um, the uh, organisms are, you know, very blunt size. Uh, when they coalesce, uh, you know, they can get... Uh, you know, 15, 20 microns. Uh, but a, a good gauge for a ruler is your RBC, which is about five microns in thickness. Um, another point to, to be made is when, when you're looking for bugs uh, in tissue, um, some high yield areas to look at are uh, the uh, cytoplasm of multinucleated giant cells, also in zones of necrosis, and in neutrophilic microabscesses. Don't spend a lot of time looking in real formed, well formed granulomas for organisms because usually that's an indication that the host is mounting a pretty good immune response and they're kind of low yield areas. So, you know, if you're going to look in both side granulomas inflammation, look in the, the cytoplasm of multinucleated giant cells. And again, remember uh, abscesses and zones of necrosis are uh, other high. And uh, our last slide here, let me go ahead and flip it this way, uh, is a uh, kind of a, a timid punch. Now this is from a mucosal surface. Uh, how do we know that? Well, the, uh, there's uh, an absent cornified layer. I mean, so it's 
very small. There's an absent granular layer. Uh, the um, cells in the upper spinous layer are a little bit swollen. There's a little bit of intracellular edema. And this pattern of keratinization without interposition of a granular layer in concert with the swollen keratinocytes is, is highly suggestive of mucosal epithelium. Also notice the lamina propria is a little bit edematous and there are no hair, hair follicles. And um, what we have down here is a focus of a granulomatous inflammation, in this case, uh, centered around a hole, and there's kind of mixoid material uh, present with a little bit of fibrin just beneath uh, the squamous epithelium. And these findings are, are very characteristic of a, of a mucosal, uh, or as the oral pathologists like to call it, mucus extravasation phenomenon, uh, and um, results generally from uh, rupture of a minor salivary gland with uh, leaking of the, uh, the saliva into the surrounding tissue, and uh, that will incite a granulomatous reaction. So mucosal, uh, and uh, you know, they, they frequently will ask this on, uh, on board exams. Well, that's about it. I'm sorry about the uh, technical uh, difficulty that we had, and um, the, the, this session will be recorded and will be repeated next week. And uh, I mean, will be repeated tomorrow. And if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to email me directly, tdavis at sagesdx.com. And uh, Dr. Martin will be joining uh, next week and running the session. Thank you very much.